Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome uh, to the session. Uh, I'm Doug Letterman, editor and co-founder of Inside Higher Ed, and I am your uh, moderator slash lion tamer for the afternoon. Um, given the folks up here with me, I may need the latter skills more than the former. Um, so topic terms like transform are thrown around willy-nilly at conferences like this. Um, and the discussions are often aspirational, even preachy sometimes. Um, and you might walk away inspired to do something, um, uh, try something, but maybe not sure what exactly and how. And um, this is not one of those panels. This, uh, this group of people up here, these are people who have created change, have, have driven change in their organizations and across, uh, across institutions at times. They do it in different ways and they have different roles and then we're gonna talk some about that. But all of them are, are sort of have done it and, are, and we're gonna, our focus today is to try to make, um, make this real, make this practical, give you some strategies for driving change at a time of <laughs> uh, more uncertainty maybe than we've had for a long time. Um, and, and we're, they're sort of gonna exploit their track records uh, and, and their inclinations uh, for, for driving that kind of change. Um, I'm gonna try and, if anything, sort of protect, pre prevent them from overwhelming you with ideas and, and their sheer force of will, but I don't think I'm gonna be able to uh, do much about that. On my far left is Bridget Burns, who's executive director of the University Innovation Alliance. Um, Michael Sorrell is uh, one step closer to me. He's the president of Paul Quinn College here in Texas. And Michelle Weiss is the vice chancellor for strategy and innovation at the uh, National University System, uh, which is based in California, um, but operates all, uh, nationally, Absolutely. as per the name. Um, so I'm gonna start, despite what I said about getting practical, I'm gonna start at a little bit of a higher level, uh, just to sort of set the stage a little bit. And I'm gonna ask each of them to talk very briefly about sort of what they do and how that shapes their definition of what transformation means. Um, and then we're gonna follow with the sort of core of the question, which is how the pandemic has altered the landscape within their particular domain and or uh, within higher education broadly um, for transformation and innovation uh, and, and how um, it affects, uh, how it has changed the work they do. So maybe start with you, Michelle, uh, with the uh, focus on the sort of, just to tell them a little bit about who you are and what you do. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Michelle Weiss. I've written a book called Long Life Learning, Preparing for Jobs That Don't Even Exist Yet. And I've been kind of straddling this space between post-secondary and the workforce for a while. Uh, grew up on the theories of disruptive innovation, worked with Clayton Christensen. And that has really kind of informed uh, the way in which I've tried to transform from both within higher ed and then uh, through different sorts of funders um, and kind of different parts of the learning ecosystem. Um, and so I'm happy to be here with you all to kind of share, share some of the learnings I've had along the way. I don't know if you want me to go into that yet. Yeah, just, well, I guess go to, talk maybe a little bit about the pandemic and its impact sure. on the landscape. Yeah, so I think the, um, one of the initial learnings from the pandemic is that, uh, and I think it's it's a continued learning for all of us uh, within higher ed, is unlike other recessions of the past, we didn't see that retreat to post-secondary education in the way that we have in past recessions, right? And part of it is there's this huge constraint on time. We don't have that. We didn't have sort of the benefit of being able to um, outsource our childcare or our caregiving of elders or whatever the thing may have been. And so, and you saw actually how more working adults were actually hoping for more short burst training opportunities. I think at one point there were different pulse surveys showing that over 60% of adults wanted something that was just gonna kind of give them that quick fix before moving on. And so that kind of bundled offering of a degree program was kind of a bridge too far for so many of them. So I think that's a real opportunity for us to think through how do we actually bring the idea of a stackable credential to life Life, because I think for many institutions, it's still aspirational, and we haven't fully figured out actually how to modularize and give people the right-sized educational pathway in the moment that they need it so they can make progress and advance and not be foregoing wages at the same time. Michael. Sure. Um, first, I, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm wearing sneakers, and I'm wearing sneakers because our men's basketball team plays for a national championship title tomorrow. So when I leave here, I'm gonna go be a fan. And when you're a fan, you get to wear sneakers, right? I get it, it's not presidential shoe wear, but 
deal with it. Um, all right, so I have been a college president for the last 15 years, and I spend my time really asking two questions. The first is just why. Why do we do things this way? Why do we have to do things this way? Why isn't there a better way? And then the second thing that I spend my time doing is asking people, my constituents, my students and the communities they come from, what do you need, right? What do you need? Because at Paul Quinn, we think that this idea that things have to be done the way they've always been done is just backwards. Things don't work. Right? They don't work for the majority of people who are having to deal with them. Right, The majority of people coming out of public education now are coming out of poverty. So to continue to design systems built for middle class and affluent kids and asking the other students who, by the way, are the majority of people now coming to school to abide by that just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to us. So with the pandemic, we treated it as more of a strategic planning process. Instead of trying to find ways to shoehorn students back to campus, we said, what if we don't bring students back until there's a vaccine? What could we transform our institution into if we looked at it from that approach? And we built new buildings, we designed new academic programming, we created a brand new model of, of higher education again to couple with our work program model. And now, you know, one of the things I'll talk about today is we've created something called the village philosophy and admissions. And what we're doing, we're saying to Pell Grant students with 3.0s or better, when you are admitted, and students from now in that category are automatically admitted, you get to bring two family members or friends with you to college. And the reason that we've adopted this philosophy is because it's a bit ridiculous to ask the people with the least amount of resources to be the heroes in their own narrative, right? We don't ask affluent students to lift their families into greater affluency or middle class students to lift their families out of things. We always are asking first generation students and Pell Grant students, it's on your shoulders to lift your family out of poverty. And then when they break down under that stress, we treat it as if it's their fault. It's a system flaw. Right? You need support. So if you can bring two family members or two friends with you and you have a support group, and then you have more help, that just makes more sense. People always talk about the way out of poverty is education. With all due respect, the way out of poverty is money. Right? So the more people in your family who have money, the more chances you have of lifting them out of poverty. That came from asking our students, what do you need and why do we have to do things the same old way? Bridget. So I uh, work with universities across the country who are many of the most innovative and who have decided to team up to try and see if they could move faster by working together. If they could learn from each other and accelerate like scaling up things that have worked in one place and in the process we could figure out how do you actually help the rest of higher ed innovate more quickly, more less expensively, et cetera. And so I think my vantage point on change and transformation is it's a lot more simple than we think. It isn't necessarily AI, it isn't necessarily blockchain. The kinds of change and innovation that is needed in higher ed, especially right now, it's about giving people time and space to actually work on their work and the design of their work, to actually see what your current systems are and see how they are failing students and they were never designed around them. Um, I think there's been a lot of talk about student-centered in higher education for a long time, but the truth is we are still not student-centered and the work of making that a reality is very simple stuff. It's getting people to piece by piece map out and see how your systems somewhat set students up like in Hunger Games as opposed to making it likely that they would complete regardless of their background and when you do that stuff, how do you actually engage with others at other institutions and share what's helped you and how do you exchange tips and tricks that are uh, simple? Um, because I, I just think that we think it's really complex and different and it's actually, the kind of change we need is pretty simple and it's always about centering the experience of the most vulnerable students. Can I just jump in on that? 
Please. Quick. Sure. Just because I, I totally agree. I think um, one of sort of my least favorite phrases is sort of meeting learners where they are because we it's like a beautiful turn of phrase, but we actually don't change our systems to actually flexibly meet learners where they are. And I think part of what you're pointing to is when we actually try to meet learners where they are and get a full sense of the skills and the assets that they bring to the table, you can actually leverage AI to do that. There are different kinds of tech tools that you can do, you, you can use to, to surface those skills and help us understand what gaps they need to fill. But it's, it's, it is this sort of mental model of kind of moving away from tech as the silver bullet and really putting some heft to this idea of meeting learners where they are and, and really trying to understand what is it that they are trying to accomplish, what is it that they need, and identifying specifically that and giving them precisely what they need. So actually, I was, I was going to go somewhere else, uh, but I want to keep going on this for a minute. About Related to the pandemic, it, it has been my impression, and I've heard a lot of people say, that institutions were forced to become more aware of, of their students' lives, their students as people, because of the pandemic. They, you know, a lot, and, and, and that there was, and we did see a surprising amount, surprising to some, amount of adaptation by institutions because they were, because they had to. And I guess what I'm curious about is, well, A, do you think institutions and changed, did some of the, the re, some of the mapping you talked about or some of the, the uh, rethinking about how they, they work with students during the pandemic? And if so, did it get into the water in ways that will mean that it is sustained? Uh, any of you, Bridget? I mean, we've been firefighting essentially the last two years. I don't think that we've changed our culture to be thinking long term about strategy. Like we've just been in constant response. And um, I think that the pandemic may just, you know, we literally saw into the homes of our students, those who have homes. And it, it, cre it created a, a greater degree of empathy, but it also exposed this long standing massive uh, failure, which is we have no meaningful way to listen to our students. There is not a way for higher education in particular to actually hear the voices of students. We've operated using like chatbot messages and surveys for a long time and we've mainly gotten lucky that when a student has a problem they'll say it to the right person and they happen to know how to move up the org chart with that complaint. Um, but we actually don't have a way to have true empathy at scale so that we can understand how our process is or is not hurt impacting students, and that's the thing we have to do next, is really start listening, take seriously the lessons of COVID, and rearrange how we spend our time so that we are actually making, we're coming up with solutions to address many of those things that are popping up in real time for students. Michael, you talked about listening to your students. Respond to Bridget, how do you do that? No, oh, no, I'm talking, Michael, how do you, how do you oh. listen to your students? Yeah, so, well, what I wanted to say that I think is fascinating is the idea of empathy at scale, right? And, and Bridget and I talk about this stuff a lot because my institution is small and there are a lot of small colleges out here who are doing those things. So when the pandemic hit, we knew the challenges that our students were gonna face because we knew our students. And the idea of the larger institutions is how do they do those things, right? Because that, that's a different challenge. Um, I don't know if you can scale empathy because if we could scale empathy, we'd have a better society, right? I mean, like we don't have an empathetic society. And so maybe the first question is how do we actually get people to behave as concerned individuals about their fellow man and woman? Well, that seems like an easy fix. Right, right. It's just completely <laughs> easy, right? But, the, I mean, and this is, this is something I think about a lot because I'm very critical of what higher education has done and what it hasn't done. In part because when you look across the current American society, the, the unifying characteristic is all of the people who are fighting all went to American colleges and universities. So there's something that we are doing that is wrong. And we don't take ownership of that the way that we should. And maybe it's because, and, and again, I, this is no criticism of large institutions, right? Because they are absolutely doing extraordinary work. But 
The idea that we're going to push everyone to mega institutions, maybe that doesn't work the way we need it to work, right? Maybe we need to examine whether or not students need to be in smaller environments where people actually listen and connect to them and can engage with them differently. Because if we had that, we wouldn't have been shocked that 80% of our students are working more than 20 hours a week. We wouldn't be shocked that people are struggling out here with food insecurity and housing insecurity. Like Those things wouldn't be surprising because you could look out into the, your lecture hall and notice the state of your students. But we have created an educational system that is a transactional experience. And transactional experiences aren't rooted in empathy. They just aren't. And so when I think about all of this, when I think about what's possible, I think we have to look at these next steps and challenge our institutions to really take a step back and ask themselves, what is it that you really want to become? Because we, the idea that we couldn't teach online was always ridiculous. People are getting married from dating online. People, Facebook created whole communities online. So the only people who couldn't function effectively online are supposed to be our professors who are some of the smartest people that we have? That, wasn't, that was never true. Right, that was just, we didn't want to do that. Right, now we have to reimagine all of this. And I just think it's a wonderful opportunity to do so. And we've got great people who can think through these things. And I just think, I mean, one of the reasons I love, you know, Bridges' organization is because she collects outstanding leaders and their organizations and then challenges them to, to engage in a cooperative fashion and think about big picture problems. And this is that moment to solve big picture problems. I mean, I think we need small institutions, large institutions. We need all because we have millions of people who are not being served right now by higher education. I just think we need to understand that the first step of design is empathy. And institutions do at scale need to be able to listen. I'm curious about the best ways to do this. I think that focus groups that are consistent diverse and surfacing insights will, is one step in the right direction. What I just, I'm running into right now is, as I go from campus to campus, is that I'm hearing people saying things like, well, we surveyed our students and they don't like online learning. They don't like surveys. Nobody liked Zoom U. That was, first off, the biggest problem that we have is we ask the wrong question and we assume we know what the right question is. We, we actually need to set ourselves up to listen open-ended to our students and hear what their experience is, what things are good, but like, the fact that we preloaded a survey question with like, do you want to go back to that terrible experience that you just had? No, nobody wants that. But that does not mean, I mean, there is no possible future in which digital learning is not an integral part of education in the future. So we just have to take a look at what was bad, take a look at there were some nuggets of things that were okay, and start leaning into expanding those practices and figure out the stuff, figure out how we do that systematically and at scale. But like, Again, I just think that we make this presumption that we know what the right question is for our students. If we want to create institutions that help them thrive no matter what, we've got to find a way to listen to them and truly integrate what their experience is into our design. Yeah, and I think to that point, I think there is this sometimes uh, tendency to sort of think more toward the 18 to 24 year old learner as we're, as we're thinking through these experiences. Um, and as we think about kind of moving away from the transactional to the relational, and we think about people returning continuously to education, they're not necessarily going to want to come back to higher education as is, right, as it's set up today. So how do we actually switch our switch our mode to just uh, to, to actually being their trusted advisor, being able to guide them in a way that helps them further their career? Uh, I, I just, um, you know, I, I think there's just so much... So much we can do there in terms of uh, just switching the narrative there, um, if, especially as we think about the separation between the, the learner and the working learner. Because during the pandemic, what was interesting is prior to the pandemic, we knew that over 73% of our existing workforce were people who had caregiving responsibilities. We just hid it from view. And what the pandemic did for all of us is showed you know, our cats on screen, our children, you know, coming into our offices, whatever the thing may be, all of our interferences. And that is going to be consistently more and more the learner we're going to be dealing with because by the mid-2030s, there's just going to be this huge enrollment cliff 
for our traditional 18 to 24 year old learners. So how are we actually pivoting to meet the needs of those working learners? I think that's that's something we have to think about as a lesson from this pandemic. Well, and we're heading into that downturn, having lost a million students over the last two years, and and I think an open question about whether they come back. So um, want a, a reminder if. Um, if you're interested in submitting a question that we're going to try, and we can try and get to at the end. You do that on the app uh, for the session. There's a I forget what the word is, but there's a place for you to right. But but so but there's a, a place to a, a link on that page to put a comment. Engage is the word. Thank you for for the help, Lizzie. So um, I want to uh, go through. Each of you has sort of comes at this uh, in a slightly different role. And Michael, maybe start with you. you. As an institutional leader, how much do you feel responsible for being the driver of transformation versus, and I'm, it, it, may, it may well be a continuum and not an oppositional, but uh, as opposed to um, enabling create you know enabling peop, uh, uh, an environment in which people transform is it a balancing act and, and and can you give some strategies for both of those approaches whichever one you favor um so I, I think a lot of it has to do with culture and what type of culture do you create at your institution and you know i said at the outset i've been president for 15 years and my presidency looks different in five year tracks. So the first five years, we were just trying to hold on, right? We were a struggling institution when I inherited it. We were gonna, the school was gonna close in 18 months and we were trying to, you know, sort of bail out the holes in the boat while we were on the water. The second five years, it was, all right, we have developed stability in a sense now we need a model to allow us to grow and thrive. This five years, it's, okay, we've got our model. Now, how do we, because our goal is to become a system, right? We wanna be a national, and actually an international network of urban work colleges. And that was going along pretty well until the pandemic. And now we're seeing something completely different we're seeing explosive growth in the online space. By this summer, we will have more online students than we will have in-person students. And that is happening at a pace, like we thought it would happen quickly, we did not understand how quickly it would indeed occur. And so at the beginning, I absolutely set the tone for transformation and innovation. You know, I would come in on meetings and always ask, is this hot? Can we make this better? No problems ever permanently solved, so what's the answer to the next set of challenges? Now, I'm so excited because I see the leadership in each of our areas asking those questions in their own way. And I see the students asking those questions. And so we've created this innovative environment where people are always sort of pushing. And I think what my primary responsibility is to make sure people feel safe to do so, right? So you don't, you don't get criticized for stumbling. You get criticized for not trying something out of the box, right? Because our students demand the very best of that type of mindset. And so, you know, I think as a, organization, as a college president, my job is to make sure people realize that they never have to play it safe because it doesn't allow us, safe doesn't allow us to address the issues our students need solving the most. Um, Michelle, I'm gonna ask kind of a flip side of the, of the question I just asked Michael, which is you are in your current role, and obviously you've done a bunch of things, but in your current role you are overseeing a, you have, you have innovation and which, uh, synonym maybe of transformation in your title. Uh, you sort of oversee, I think, a, sort of something of a unit you know, do you see the, is, how much is the unit uh, uh, meant to be a driver of transformation? How much is it dependent on the signaling from the, the top, the, 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 the institutional leaders? And how much is it, is your role about dispersing uh, this through the, through the institution? 
Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Uh, so I had a similar role at Southern New Hampshire University, um, and I have this role now at uh, National University, and and I'm approaching it actually quite differently. I think. Uh, one one way that people have done it in the past, and this is partly, I think, uh, what people have learned from the theories of disruption is the idea that if you break off a sort of like a separate autonomous growth unit, that's a, it's a simpler way of moving more nimbly. It's like having a startup within a, within a larger organization. So I think a lot of mega universities, larger larger organizations have tried to build in that way. I think the challenge that you run into when you build in parallel is that at some point you do have to integrate the efforts. And I think the cultural differences are very hard to mesh when you separate them and silo them in that way. The other part of it is when you have innovation in a particular hub, it can work against your attempts to innovate from within because nobody wants to think that innovation is somehow housed in one area versus every, every unit has an innovative aspect to it. Um, and so how do you empower those units? I think that's more the approach we're taking now is we're realizing that we're going to have way more success if we have people from across the university, if we offer them a, pain, a, a solution to their pain point and give them different opportunities to look at some solutions that they might want to consider, if they're moving forward with that idea versus us kind of pushing it on them from that top-down perspective, it is just a far more transformative and um, has way more momentum to it. I think that's what we've really learned is turning each person, each stakeholder into almost like an initiative owner. Reminds me of a little bit of the conversations around DEI and whether people have separate vice, you know, if it's no one's response, if it's one person's responsibility, does that mean it's everybody else's, it isn't? So I, I think there's some interesting parallels. Uh, Bridget, what were you going to add? I, I just want to yes and that in that um, the most innovative spaces really have to, you think more creatively about capacity and how you staff and support innovation. And I would often come in and see places where it's like there's a vice president for innovation, which is like sending this message that somehow this person high up is going to shove innovation down in, or that there's a center over here where that's where the good ideas are, right? But what we found is that actually everyone who works in higher education is capable of innovation. They're just overwhelmed by, I put my phone up here, by their calendar and their inbox. Good ideas do not interrupt you. And you have to actually set people up to have time and space to engage in the, asking the right questions and thinking about the right questions. And so what we found is you find the person who is the most overburdened with work because the reward for good work, well executed, is more work, right? So that's the person who's super competent. So you find those people, VP-ish for student, for like undergraduate or whatever. They, they can be all over, but you look for, their, their plates are massive. And instead of hiring more of those people, what you do is you hire what feels like a project manager, but as a chief of staff under that person to essentially offload the low hanging fruit and to lighten their load. So they can, so the person who's highly competent and ex executes well can now actually have a little bit of time to actually work on ideation and brainstorming um, that has been very successful for us, and it answers one of the questions that's popped up about early career professionals. Uh, we created the UIA Fellows Program, but there are places in higher ed at ASU and other, other throughout where they're really focusing on this kind of skill and the competency is project management, uh, kind of cross-functional innovation uh, support, and shuttle diplomacy. Those are the skills that we need, that we are weak at in higher ed, and you, you hire folks like that at that level, they offload the senior level person's plate, and you, you, I mean, there's more things you can do, and I can talk about the tactical things I will often advise institutions about, but it's really, that is the most transformative thing, is actually lightening the loads of the people who we know can deliver. Um, Bridget, I'm going to continue with you just because I want to focus on your role a little bit. So so both of these folks are within institutions and uh, um, you work across institutions and I'm interested in sort of what you, how different, how is cross institutional work different from with intra institutional work uh, and, and what are the sort of top uh, strategies that you have focused on um, and benefited from, I guess. I mean, I think about. institutional and cross-institutional, it's about social safety around failure. 
Uh, failure is the greatest teacher. We know this from other innovative spaces. Higher ed is a space where we don't admit failure exists, and we hide the million dollar failures on all of our campuses under the carpet. We never talk about them, we never admit them, and therefore we force other people to repeat those mistakes. So what we focus on is the only way within the alliance for you to get on stage I don't care if you've done something. I do care if you have done something and you have coached another institution to replicate it. That's where I wanna learn. I wanna know what you taught them. I wanna hear about the first three steps. I wanna hear about the advice you gave that you wished you'd had before you started. The only way that you get attention and like the, you get yeah, I guess praise and attention is sharing lessons from failure. And we operate with Chatham House rules so that people won't disclose who said it or their institution, so there's social safety. Um, that's a really important piece that is missing, I think, from the broader ecosystem, is we have a culture throughout higher ed that is about praising, like, headlines and posturing and how great we are. And my institution is the best at boobity bop Cool, doesn't help anybody. What helps me is what has been hard for you? What did you learn? What do you wish you'd known? And, um, and, and talk to me about the story of that hardship. That's the way that we help each other. And so we're a community of practice trying to basically you know, share the lessons learned so other people can actually move faster. And I think within the institutions, what I notice is I come in and I'm looking for, um, is there social safety around failure? And the question I always ask is, do you have an autopsy process? Because most institutions do not have a way to unpack what went wrong, what we should have done differently, and how we could learn from it. And if you are interested in being a space of innovation, that's the first topic I would suggest having, is what, what kind of autopsy process could we have that would surface insights, or you know, what did we learn from this experience? Um, and the other that I know, just because I want to tactically give you stuff to put in your pocket, is what's our strategy around new ideas? Because new ideas don't interrupt you. If you don't know where they're coming from, they're not going to just like happen magically. Um, I always want to ask, you know, where are the places or that recently, you know, think of an idea or a new strategy that came about. Where did it come from? Is it when so-and-so had a retreat? Is it when that team had an offsite? Okay, well, we're not gonna get more of those if we don't figure out where good ideas are coming from in this institution, and then how do we support them? Because in too many places in higher ed, a new idea has to get debated to have a chance. And I believe that yes and, and creating space for us to actually iterate and pitch and catch ideas and evolve them is what's needed. And, we, and how, are we gonna, how are we gonna actually like get this ready so that it could possibly be something that would be successful? So those are just, I would say social safety around failure, and those are the two things I would do at the institutional level. Yeah, what you're what you're saying, Bridget, reminds me of I saw Jack Ma just speaking. Uh, I didn't actually go to the World Economic Forum, but he was speaking there, and uh, he was saying, "There's no point in me writing a book about my success. You're not going to learn anything from it. I'd much rather write a book about all of my failures because that's going to teach you a lot more." Um, but one of the things I was going to kind of tap into what you were saying is, um, in in terms of lessons learned, it's it's an important thing for institutions to take a look at all of the things that started off as pilots. We tend in higher ed to, to launch a pilot and then just let it go. It just kind of becomes the new solution that we rely on. We don't actually evaluate whether it's working for our people. So there are these different kinds of ways in which you can identify an innovation, but also make sure that along the way, you are making sure that the different stakeholders, because the people who say yes to the innovation initially, aren't necessarily always gonna be the ones who are deploying it every day, right? Because it's gonna be a faculty member or an advisor or whoever it is. And it's important over, say, a one-year period as you're testing it to make sure you're connecting with each of those stakeholder groups and identifying whether this is actually solving for what it initially was set up to do. Because I think we tend to kind of launch these pilots as sort of a easing our way into what will ultimately just be a full-time contract. Um, and that's one way to kind of begin to kind of think through is this truly a transformative innovation? Is this actually getting to the radical change that we were hoping for? It, um, the focus, if you're, hopefully you're listening closely and sensing a lot of talk about experimentation and evaluation and safety in failure. And those are, uh, all of them have said versions of this. This is, this is not what this industry does. And it is, you know, it's interesting as a journalist, those are the stories 
like trying to get institutions to talk publicly and Bridget, you know, you're able to do it in a safe space and I get that, but you know, in terms of helping people learn, getting places to talk about things that are even minimally suboptimal is very difficult. And I think it's part of why um, it's hard to get things to, to, to be picked up by other institutions because um, people th hear things happening and they're like, yeah, well, I, I get that that worked for you, but why, you know, where is it gonna run into, run aground on my campus and where did it, where did it go wrong? What did you, so I, I don't know, how, how do you sense bringing, encouraging, Michael, how do you do it locally? Is it just, I mean, uh, how do you in, uh, uh, encourage that or, or discourage any fear of failure on your own, in your own, so what steps do you take? Yeah, you know, um, before I answer that question, let me say this, it's really hard to get any of this right, all right? Um, and, and part of it is just the industry itself. So when you succeed, everyone wants to talk to you about how you succeeded. So you're invited to a bunch of conferences. You're, not this one, because this one's really cool, but you're invited to a bunch of things and you're expected to continue to talk about that stuff. But that getting consumed by that almost guarantees that you will become a one trick pony. Because the time, like what Bridget talked about, like the time that you need to sort of reflect upon what's, what happened, what you got right, what you got wrong, that needs to take place in whatever your creative process is. You know, for me, I need 4.30 in the morning until 6, right? Like, I need the ability just to be, like, no kids running around. You know, my wife is still sleeping. Like, I need the time to just sit. And, but then you've got to answer 6.2 million emails, right? And then you've got, you've got all this stuff that just comes with it. And so what we've tried to do, and actually... My, it was funny, I was laughing because when you're talking about like how we find people. So I have a chief of staff who's great taking things off my plate so I can now make up more stuff. Um, and one of the things that she and I were talking about literally when I was walking into the convention center was what would happen if we cleared one week off of all the cabinet's calendars where you don't meet anyone right? You just sit and do your desk work, right? However you analyze it, however you interpret it, right? So you don't have to prepare for meetings. You don't have to think about meetings. You don't have to, like, you just do your work and catch up on emails and then just, just create. And we're going to try it, right? So I can come back next year and tell you how it went, right? Um, but on the question that, that Doug asked about failure, listen, like, you have to you create a culture where failure is seen as okay by, as a leader, talking about your failures. And you can't just talk about your failures once in a while, right? Like, you have to be open with people to understand, and you have to be able to make fun of yourself when you fail, right? So that people aren't sitting there thinking, oh, my God, like, it's this big thing, right? Like, I am happy to tell you how I screwed it up, right? And I talk about how... You know, if there's been any one thing that I've been particularly good at in higher education, it's failing, right? Like, so, look, we try, Paul Quinn, we tried to be a normal college. That didn't work, right? We tried to have a football team. That didn't work. That's how we got a farm out of it, right? We, we, we became an urban work college because being a normal college just wasn't going to get it for us. We had to learn, like, every step of the way, it was, like, we, we figured out a different accrediting model because the normal accreditation stuff wasn't really working well for us. I mean, you have to be willing to say, that doesn't work. Now what, right? What's next? Because you can't just stop at the point that didn't work. You can't just stop at your failure. So we don't even call it failure. We just simply tell each other, we don't allow our stumbles to become a fall, right? 
Stumbles are expected. They're part of the iterative process. You are rewarded for what happens after your stumble. And that's how we've done it. And, and I just try and be transparent and authentic, and I own my mistakes, and then we move on. Bridget, you sound like you... Um, when I coach presidents on this, uh, if you need to create social safety by modeling uh, what it's like to learn from failure on your on, in your senior leadership team. And, and there are plenty of opportunities. When something goes wrong, it's the word, it's the question you ask, it's the way you ask it, and do you actually... Uh, create space to like process out like okay so what steps did we miss and how how can we set ourselves up in the future to do that differently as opposed to I can't believe that we did that right like I mean you could you watch their body language like I mean executive cabinets are like fascinating for me um, you can figure out why institutions are innovative or not based on just how they flow um, but I I do think if there's anything about my work, it's trying to create values where, and I saw the question about more empathetic culture uh, at elite institutions. Um, I think of my work as trying to make uh, sharing about lessons from failure and doing the right work around, you know, prioritizing low income first generation and students of color sexy and cool. And so I'm willing to throw all kinds of things at it. Uh, whether it's a fake internet TV show that I have with Doug um, or, or creating a podcast, whatever needs to happen, and then surfacing and elevating stories where people sharing from failure are modeled as brave because that's what it is. It's bravery. Like when uh, Michigan State lets me talk about how they discovered they were sending 450 emails in the first three months when a student is enrolled. And they found that they had 50 types of holds that a student has on their account that prevents them from registering. The institution didn't know about because they spent one afternoon just putting post-it notes up on the wall and process mapping. The fact that I can tell you that story and keep my job, that's because they have been socialized to understand that is bravery to be willing to share something that is a powerful insight for the field. So like, I think the rest of us are playing a role here and talking about the kinds of behavior that we need more of. And that's maybe the best way we can try and combat that like desire to always posture as though everything's perfect. Yeah, the bravery is like, if you listen to what Michael's talking about, it's all about vulnerability, right? Owning the mistake. And it's ultimately fundamentally about communication. And I don't think we actually take the time to really talk it through and slow down and evaluate what went wrong before moving on. And this is, I think, when I was looking at one of the questions about you know, young professionals and the kinds of skills they need, the thing as we deal with the pivots, because we are having to pivot frequently because we make a mistake, we realize it doesn't work, we gotta pivot and do something else. To make it feel like not innovation fatigue for your people, that communications piece has to be in there and some kind of resourcing around change management has to be there. And I think for all of us, as we think about ourselves as middle managers or leaders or you know, just kind of frontline workers, whatever the thing may be, we're not actually taught the skills of change management and what it actually means to build resilience in a culture. And I think that is critical for our younger learners all the way up through you know, our, our working learners. How do we actually build that into a curriculum so people, people understand the communication, the strategic communication that goes into authentically having these conversations about things that have gone wrong, right? And how you build a roadmap going forward. And can I, let me say this one thing about how you get a lot of this communicated and how you learn to listen to your institutions. I think all senior leaders should teach, right? I think they should all teach courses. At Paul Quinn, I teach, the Vice President of Academic Affairs teaches, our Chief Administrative Officer teaches. We don't let our CFO teach, that's a whole different story. Um, but I think there is a perspective that you gain from actually being in the classroom with the students and listening to what it is that they care about, right? And what their experiences are. Like Bridget, when you, when you talked about the number of emails that were sent, I thought about my classes on Sunday nights, right? And one of the things that one of the students was talking about was like, you know, you all send a lot of emails, right? And, but, my staff feels like the students never read the emails. But at no point 
did anyone on our staff ever stop to think, maybe it's because you send too many damn emails. So now we can go back, and but those little tidbits that come just from just simple interaction. And I don't know how anyone can hope to be effective at any job, any career, any assignment, if you are disconnected from your core constituency. And at institutions, at universities, you know, as leaders, we can become so bogged down with all the other stuff that you could literally never interact with students. Now you can go to the cafeteria every now and then and that becomes a production, right? Or, but if you sit in a class with people, you learn differently. So I just think that that, and it also feeds the soul. You know, one of the questions that people seem to have is about the number of professionals who are choosing to leave. And that's a really complicated question. You know, we were actually talking about that out front. You know, it's, it's, it's not always about the money. In some respects, people feel cut off from the students. And the students are part of what really rejuvenates you. Right, and gives you that, that engagement, that spirit. Um, but some of it is people, like the pandemic changed people. You know, I mean, look, I loved working every day in my gym shorts and sweatpants, right? It was fantastic. I loved being home with my kids. And if I could figure out how to run a college in my gym shorts and sweatpants every day, I would do it, right? So I understand it, but that, we have students who show up every day and we've got to figure out how to get back on track with that and it's going to be hard like there are no easy answers on that one. looks like you're almost pulling it off though the gym you know the sneakers so yeah um I'm keeping it real. I'm yeah keeping it real though. um i guess i want to I, I was just thinking about sort of how what motivates um transformation or, or, or pro propels the need for transformation in higher education. And Michael, I'm curious whether, I mean, you took over Paul Quinn. I don't know if you would use the word desperate, but it sounded like it was in a tough situation. Southern New Hampshire, which is obviously one of the most innovative institutions in the, was facing real uh, pretty fundamental issues back when Paul LeBlanc decided to change how it operates. So. How much, and, and a lot of institutions that are, are pretty comfortable, and I guess I'm curious the extent to which you need some combination of uh, fear, <laughs> of, of um, sorry, of, um, you know, and uh, so how, how do you drive innovation amid comfort, and do you need? From comfort. Well, yeah, you know, in a, in a oh. time of comfort. So this is, this is, I mean, you could literally be in the Sorrell home and hear this lecture almost every day. I do not believe anything great can come from places of comfort. You need your water troubled, right? You need, it, it is a rare individual who can look around and say, huh, things are pretty good. Let's do something different, right? Because there's more risk involved in that. It is very liberating to be in an environment that you can't mess up, right? Like, I mean, things are so bad at Paul Quinn. Like, literally, that was the advice some of my friends gave me. They're like, you can't make it worse, <laughs> right? Um, and so I think, I think those types of moments, um, like, do create freedom, but but comfort is so seductive. It's just, you know, you're like, oh, it's good, I'm okay. Like, I don't have to do this, like I could just, and at that moment, creativity begins to slowly die. And I think you have to continue to ask yourself, I, my estimation is, is the rare individual who can continue to ask themselves, how do I keep making this better? So I'm gonna respectfully disagree. <laughs> Just because I do understand, uh, you know, from from past from past universities that yes, financial duress is a great catalyst for change. Well, I don't think it always has to be financial duress. Some sort of duress, right? Some sort of stressor. 
at National University, we have an enormous endowment, and yet we feel that imperative to change because with all of the sort of marketplace effects within higher ed, we are all seeing a massive consolidation of efforts in these mega online universities who are kind of just plowing forward, doing what they're doing in this, in this format. For us, as we look at what we want to be when we grow up, we don't actually want to emulate that model. We want to actually figure out a totally different model where we can maybe, while they're zigging, we can zag to a different area and really think through how do you actually build a lifelong learning infrastructure for, for folks so that people will actually want to come back and get exactly what they need and move on and then come back later again as they have to retool to stay competitive. So I think there are, you know, is it, is it the norm? No. But I think it is possible to do just because the dynamics of this marketplace are such that there is nothing we can hold on to, right? So, so I want to ask, who are your students, the demographic of your students? We have older adult learners. All right. So might it be that while the institution itself is comfortable, that your students are coming to you in a place that's a little less comfortable? So you all emulate, you all sort of take on their reality because you know your students. So the issue isn't the comp like the financial resources, mm -hmm. it's that you all have the same mentality of your students aren't getting what they need, aren't getting what they need which is discomfort, mm -hmm. right? So I win, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just, I'll, I'll add that, you know, you can talk about a discomfort or not, but I, what I pay attention to is where the best ideas come from, and I rarely see them come out of a moment of scarcity and the mental space of, that scarcity creates. So um, that's really about leadership. That's about visionary leaders coming in and providing clarity of perspective. Here's the vision. Here's where we need to go. And to not like, I don't think you can scare people into creativity. Um, I do think that you can connect them to purpose, and they can bring out their best ideas. Um, the question that I saw earlier about the mass exodus of people leaving higher ed, I did want to um, add that I think that we're misreading that. I think that what we are seeing is a combination of burnout, which higher ed seems to think the solution is that you're going to take a vacation, um, which most people can't afford to go, and where are you going to go? Um, that's not necessarily, I mean, yes, people should take time off, but burnout is really, is, is a symptom of disconnection from purpose, lack of inspiration, and lack of community. Those are the things we need to lean in on if we want to address burnout. We need to create experiences where people feel like they are not alone, that they are in connection and community. We need to re-invite invite them to connect to purpose and the vision of the work, and we need to actually create experiences where people will feel an emotion uh, alongside their colleagues. So there are lots of things you can do. You can screen unlikely. You can, there, are sh there are movies, the documentaries out there. Remind people why we do this work and help them feel and reconnect that emotion. Um, but then you actually create spaces for people to engage in, you know, engaging in empathy exercises. Go out and interview a bunch of students. Understand what they're going through, what, what challenges they've had. And then you pick one place where you've, you all agree that there's a clear problem. You know, say, say it's our, like, I don't know, financial aid process, it's our, um, it's major change, it's transfer, whatever. You pick one topic and you invite people into a room for an afternoon to engage in process mapping of that one thing. And what will happen is people will in that room realize, oh my gosh, first off, the system is not as good as I thought it was. Second, a lot of these things can actually be fixed today. There, there are some prop, there are some booby traps and some landmines that so-and-so runs that department, they're in this room with me right now, we can fix this. And it, what it, people start feeling the endorphins of a little bit of low hanging fruit. All of a sudden they feel a little momentum, a little like, oh my gosh, we actually did something today. And I feel like I, feel like I made a change and I know that this is affecting students. And then what I coach institutions on is, you wanna do that three to four times a year. And you will see a total transformation because especially if you have the president come in at the end of the day and say, what did we learn? Uh, you now have your people have already solved many problems. They've identified new ways to serve students and they feel like they're reconnected to the purpose of the work and they feel like change is possible. I mean, the cost is an afternoon of people and post-it notes. I recommend serving snacks as well and playing some sweet jams. Um, that's, that's the thing I would suggest. It's not about fear. 
It's about we want to pay attention to the human emotions in general when it comes to change and innovation. And regardless of if you are in discomfort or comfort, um, we want to set the conditions for people to be as creative as possible, to feel in community and aligned around the vision, and that change is something they can actually all be a part of. And so I, that's a long way to, to move on that, that question, but I would just add that the we're misreading this issue about mass exodus because we think that we just need to jack up people's salaries. And yes, we need to pay more. I think that HR actually needs design and innovation support and expertise to help them reimagine position descriptions for the workforce now. We are, the way we designed work was very much in the past and we actually need to update how we structure it. We need career trajectories out of positions that never had one. We need mentorship and real professional development. And I don't think HR has those skills necessarily. I, I, they're wonderful people, but we actually need to staff and support them helping us get through this. And it's about reimagining work. Otherwise, we're gonna continue to lose people. It's, I, I wanna, I, I, the interesting conversation about fear, and I guess I, Bridget, and I wouldn't dare tell you how your institutions operate, but they were certainly brought together by a sense that they were underperforming in one pretty fundamental way, which was helping, or they, they, they wanted to produce more low income and, and underrepresented students. And so I guess what I'm, and, and the reason I brought it up is I see this ecosystem, um, I think COVID was a, was a, pr a prompter, it, it, it forced change and as we slowly emerge or, or whatever comes next, I see the compulsion to 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 do things differently ever so slowly starting to fade because I think people are getting either comfortable or they're they're sensing I don't know and I guess I'm 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 worried that the sense that things need to change is going to start to fade and the comfortableness with the status quo is going to is going to come back and I don't know, Michelle you've you've studied this process a lot do you have any thoughts on that yeah, I think what maybe is hidden a little bit is even prior to the pandemic, even if you look at sort of the number of colleges and universities we had from 2012 to 2017, we actually dropped about 400 universities in that period. And then when you think about the layering on of all of the challenges of the pandemic and losing a million students and you know potentially 15% of enrollments in, in almost every school right are at risk, this this is a big deal. And then you top on to that, right, the witchy data that shows us, you know, how we didn't have enough babies during the last recession and there aren't enough 18 to 24 year olds to come into our, you know, over 4,000 institutions. So, you know, for me, I'm, I, I, I question I question why we're not seeing more movement, um, especially a pivoting toward this adult learner market, knowing that our traditional market is going to winnow, right? Because I think we should all be in a panic about this, like that the, the, the status quo will not do for the future and we're gonna see some great consolidation, great mergers, great, um, and just great losses, um, unless we start to figure out how do we build a niche or within a region, how do we think about building a strategic portfolio of offerings through a consortium of colleges? Like we have to start getting very creative about how we survive this future, because it's not, it's not assured. Um, I want to, um, I think to, to model, um, there's a question in here about a f uh, asking each of us to talk about a failure um, and what we've learned from it. Um, who wants to go first? Uh, real quickly, I used to think that scale was very black and white, like cut and paste, and that I would see an example of a program on one campus, and then I would judge the campus who was trying to replicate it uh, as a failure if it didn't look exactly the same. And I was totally missing the, the adaptation and how they evolved it and tweaked it to make it work into a totally different culture and different environment, that that was actually the learning and the lesson. And I, I spent probably two years in that like really old school way of, you know, instead of judgment, should have leaned in with curiosity. And so that's for me a failure, is I totally misinterpreted um, a lot of successes as being, well, they didn't do it exactly like this one, so therefore it wasn't really scale, and I was just missing it. Very quickly, my, my failure was probably my first failure as a college president. Um, we were in an under-resourced community. I, 
am not a stranger to under-resourced communities from my engagement, from the things that my parents did in terms of community work and all of that. And I intellectually understood one of the issues, but you know, my solution was a stupid solution. You know, I, I understood like health and wellness was a big concern and under-resourced community. So I thought the answer was to build a fancy gym, right? Like a health and wellness center where people could work out and get advice on food. And you know, like my dumb, dumb behind missed that there was no grocery store. So maybe we should have focused on getting, a, and so I couldn't get people to invest in the idea of a health and wellness center absolutely then had to back up and go talk to the people in the community. They're like, we don't have a grocery store, which then led to terminating the football program, turning the football field into a farm, and fighting with the city until they built a grocery store in that community. So, you know, just learning how to really listen was a great gift from that failure. I think it's the, the lesson, the failure that I lear learn every single day is around communication. Uh, I just learned this quote from uh, George Bernard Shaw that really resonates with me, which, where he says, the single biggest uh, failure in communication is the illusion that it, it has happened. Um, and <laughs> for me, I feel that every day. <laughs> For me, for me, that feels uh, every day when you think you're being so clear, or you're, you know, you're you're putting forward an idea, and you're you're trying to socialize it, you're trying to get buy-in, you're trying to communicate across different stakeholder groups, and you feel like you have done the job of sharing the story. What I've come to realize is you cannot over communicate in this environment, especially within academia. People need to feel included. And you also have to include, to your point, Bridget, about clarity of purpose and vision. Purpose and vision also has to be kind of re-articulated depending on which group you're talking to. So some people identify with a sense of purpose around self and feeling valued as a, you know, as an achiever. Some people really believe in the sense of purpose around community building or society building, right? Others sort of think about it in terms of teams. Others think about it in terms of the organization. Like people have just different ways of affiliating and if your message doesn't hit on sort of all five of those sources of meaning, it, you're probably only gonna hit like 20% of your target audience. And so every time we think we're being so clear, I just realize it's always some, somehow a failure of communication. So the clock has hit zero and that could give me an out for not sharing my failure, but that would be cheating. So I'll, I'll cite two. One is professional. I was told, you know, two years out of college that, the new, that uh, after two years working at the New York Times that I was not New York Times material, which was very humbling and completely animated the rest of my work life. And then personally, more recently, you know, uh, my family went through some trauma and um, I found myself sort of soft pedaling some of the harder conversations with my kids in ways that totally came back to bite me in the butt later and sort of really reinforced for me sort of the the sort of coming clean and being tr as truthful as possible even when it's difficult right up front you sort of there's never never a lot to be gained from um soft pedaling and and hiding, pulling back from the truth. Um, we are out of time. Um, thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks to Bridget Burns, Michael Sorrell, Michelle Weiss, uh, and I hope you have a great rest of the conference and good luck getting back home. <laughs>